All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, oh no. Number five. Pull the main back uh, about one dB. All right. We want to. Hello. We want to welcome you guys. Am I on? Hello. Hello. It might have been a little much. Okay. Uh, we want to welcome you guys here uh, this morning, and we're starting a little bit differently if you're visiting with us or if you're watching online. Uh, today, I'm wanting to start in light of the fact that there's honestly, there's a, a, a good handful of people that are, that are out uh, of being able to meet with us here today for a variety of different reasons. And for a lot of them, uh, life has happened, uh, as some of you guys can kind of attest to and, and raise your hand of, yeah, life has happened for me as well. And in particular, uh, I've received more than a handful of, of phone calls and texts from, uh, from, from loved ones, from friends, that in light of everything specifically that's happened this week in the life of our country, there's been a... Um, there's been a variety of different expressions of, of anger and fear and all kinds of different things, anxiety. And what I wanted to do today is uh, I asked if the praise team, they, they normally start with kind of an upbeat song, and I don't want us to start dour in any way, but I do want us to to begin just a little bit differently of of wanting to give you guys an opportunity that if if so far your your life as we've entered into 2021 with everything that's going on within the country and everything that's going on just within our personal lives that if you're wanting to uh just have a moment to kind of uh settle yourself before we spend the next hour or so with the lord uh, i felt like that would be the best thing for us to be able to do is be reminded that he is um he's powerful he's sovereign he's in control and though all of these things, whether there's things going on in your personal life or things that are going on within our country that, that are, they're not unimportant, but we want to just turn our attention to, to, to him and prioritize him here this morning. And so we're going to do two things. I'm going to read a scripture to you this morning out of the book of Colossians. And then the other is, if you've been with us, we have incorporated a time of prayer in our service to where we'll spend maybe about, I don't know, three, five minutes of just just prayer. And we have our little prayer station here, and you guys have used this over the last several weeks of just, uh, again, it's kind of a hands-on way if you want to write something down. As I've mentioned before, if there's a specific need that you have that's heavy on your heart, I'm a big fan of casting your cares upon him. And if I can do that kind of literally, uh, it's helpful for me in the way that my mind works. And so uh, if you want to do that and you would allow me to be invited in into to your life, you don't even have to put your name. I scoop up those requests and I pray for them first thing tomorrow morning. Um, but we want to invite you to do and have the opportunity for prayer for the, for the first two songs that we have. And so they're aware that if some of you in the midst of the first song you want to sing, but in the second song you really want to kind of use the prayer station or you want to sit at your seat and pray or if you want to come to the altar and pray, the praise team is aware that there very well may be movement from you. But we, we encourage and invite you to use this time, these next couple of songs, um, to be our prayer time today uh, while uh, songs are taking place. And so uh, encourage you to do that and to participate in that. If, uh, if, if you feel led, you can do it there, but you can also do it here as well. But if you would, I want to invite you to stand with me. I'm going to just read our passage, if you would stand, our scripture reading today. It comes out of the book of Colossians. And just let these words just kind of wash over you and be reminded of uh, just who our God is. And then when I'm finished, you can remain standing, join them in song. You can come and use the prayer station, whatever you need to do. But take these next couple of songs to do what you need to do this morning. It says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And the hymn is Jesus. So let's worship him today, let's pray to him today, let's sing to him today, but let's take this time to get our focus on Jesus. Everybody here knows there's only one Lord of heaven. And he is the righteous judge of all, and he's in total control. 
Let's tell them about it. Scriptures tell us <clears throat> to wait on the Lord. And he will be our salvation. Thing I'm 
myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay you guys can have a seat uh as, as we kind of get started with the message here this morning, if you're watching online, you wonder where I just went. Uh, I forgot something. Uh, for a lot of you guys, you do know that um, uh, as we're beginning kind of a new series here this morning, we're going to be going into the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open to the book of Acts. And as you're making your way, the, it, way there, one of the things that I have found uh, is if any of you have ever had the issue of your, of your phone uh, just kind of being a little bit glitchy, it's one of the more annoying things when your cell phone is doing that. And so finally you make the phone call to maybe your cell phone provider, Verizon or Sprint or AT&T, and you give them a phone call and, and you're been pretty frustrated. You finally get a human being on the other end of the line. You begin to talk to them uh, to kind of tell them your situation. And they're trying to give you the answer of what you need to do in order to be able to proceed with your life and with your cell phone. But you're so frustrated because you've been on hold for about two hours that you just need to kind of share your 10 minute story of why your life has been miserable. And they're just waiting for you to finish your little diatribe. And by the time you get done, they just simply ask this question. And you've probably had this. When's the last time you turned your phone off? When's the last time you let it shut all the way down so that you could bring it all the way back up? When's the last time basically did, that you were able to reset your phone? And my answer normally to that is, well, never. It's a phone. You gave it to me. I'm going to use it. I need to use it for all a variety of different things. And so uh, what I found is I could set, turn my phone off, let it reset itself, and then it would come back on and the phone was fixed. It'd be nice if there was uh, a way to do that with a lot of other things in our life, if we could turn off other things and it could reset and it'd be back to where it needs to be. And what I, what I want us to do as we go into our study in the book of Acts is we're at a time in the life of, of the church of where a reset has, in a way, kind of been taking place. If you look at 2020, 2020 was a very unique year. Uh, I shared with you that, and be careful with statistics, but I shared with you that there is a statistic that there are churches that are going to come out of the 2020 pandemic, go into 2021, and that one in five may not continue past 2021 because of how how unique this has been where some uh, congregations haven't even been able to gather together to congregate to be able to meet. And so there's this, there's this idea that one of the things that we could do is we could look at the situation, we could be fearful of the situation, or we could recognize that this is a very opportune time that doesn't catch God off guard, but it's a time where we could begin to reset and find that Apparently, there were some things in the life of the church or a church family that we thought were absolutely essential that we haven't done for months. And we've realized, maybe not unimportant, but essential, like absolutely vital for the purpose and the mission and the vision of the local church. And so we, we haven't seen something like on this scale of like a global pandemic since, what, 1917 with the Spanish flu. And God, you, you are alive at this time. Mission Point specifically exists at this time, I believe, to where God is saying, will you, as individuals and as a church family, will you steward this pandemic? Will you steward what's gone on in 2020? Will you be a people that you can, in a way, kind of reset? Because this isn't anything that's even particularly new as far as something being reset. Um, when we get into the book of Acts, this is around the time of Pentecost. It's going to be about 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And what's happened is for years, for centuries, the Jewish people have been worshiping and, and going to God in a particular rhythm and a particular way. And then Jesus shows up and just changes everything. That sacrificial system, I fulfill it. The temple, I, I, I'm the temple. In fact, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit and you're going to be the temple. He begins to really change and kind of reset things to where the ultimate purpose, as we've studied before, of God, which is he be glorified, that's definitely going to continue on. But the way that the mission is going to be accomplished, it's, it's been reset a little bit. It's going to look a little bit differently. And so in order for that to happen, he, he tells them to wait, <laughs> He tells them to, to wait on me and specifically to wait on the person of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that we do. We have an opportune time right now to kind of reset and say, okay, 
there, there's not just a pandemic that we've gone through where the church has kind of had to adjust a little bit this year, but for us particularly, specifically as Mission Point, it's, it's a new year, we're going into a new series, you have a new pastor, there's a lot of new that is going on to give us the opportunity to kind of go, okay, if we were to strip it and bring it all the way down and just take a look at what you have to say, what would it look like? How could we reset this in, in a positive way where the mission is the priority and your glory is really that purpose? And my hope is that as we go through the book of Acts, and we're not going to go through the entire, we're going to look at about the first 10 chapters over the course of the next nine weeks. And as we go through this, it's just this reminder of here's God's kind of pres prescription of what the church is going to look like. This is the birth, the origin, and it's really setting a template for what we would want to be about. And though we're going to find out some interesting tidbits as we go through the book of Acts uh, that are going to be interesting, if if we think that one of our goals is to gather a little bit more information, then that, that's not at all. That's not even close to one of the goals that I want us to have. I, I want us to be able to come out of this study and, and resetting ourselves and kind of evaluating ourselves, restarting, relaunching, all of those things that you can think of, but for the purpose that we would recognize that we are to be a people who have power and that we are a force for, for the glory of God and for the good of men within our world because we are the institution that God has put in place in order for there to be hope, in order for there to be joy, in order for there to be peace and life transformation. It's going to be the church that God has called upon to do this, which is you and which is me. And far too often, we, we've kind of hunkered to the side or listened to the lies of the enemy of, of distracting us of our primary call and our primary purpose. And my hope is that this would be a sweet time to where, yeah, we're going to learn some theology and some ecclesiology and soteriology and, and, and all these different things that we could go, oh, we can nerd out on that. That's real interesting. But we don't want to miss the point that we want to know that there is power in the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells within the believer in Christ, and there is clarity of what we are supposed to be about. And sometimes it's good for me to step back, to reset, and go, okay, God, remind me, what's this about? What, what's your instructions? And so if you have your Bible, and you are in the book of Acts, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 1. Verse 1, I'm going to do just a little bit of an introduction, and then we're going to get into kind of the heart and into the meat of this. But it says, uh, the first account I compose, Theophilus. And we're going to stop right there, which some of you makes you nervous because it's 1020. How long is this going to go? But we're going to stop right there. The first account I compose, Theophilus. You can interact in this moment. Um, sometimes when pre preachers ask questions, we don't want you to interact, uh, but sometimes we do. And so my question is, who wrote the book of Acts? Who? Luke, yes. Luke wrote the book of Acts. So when Luke says the first account, I, Luke, compose Theophilus, well, this is his second account that he has composed. What's his first account? Luke. Luke, yes, very good. It wasn't a trick question. It's the gospel of Luke. And what's interesting is he's, he's, he's writing this specifically to this guy named Theophilus. Now, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of ink spilt of who is this guy, Theophilus. Well, there's only one other time that he's mentioned in Scripture and I think we have it on the screen. Uh, go to Luke chapter 1. You can either go in your Bible or you can see on the screen. But Luke chapter 1, we find this passage where it says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those, uh, by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me, really focus in on verses 3 and 4, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, again, to most excellent Theophilus. It's just a name that means either friend of God or lover of God. And, and what it is, is there's this individual that we believe to be a, a person in history that Luke is saying, I want you to know the truth. And there's a few key words that just pop out to me. He, he's like saying, I want to, in, I'm, I've, I've investigated this. Luke is a physician. He's very detailed in his writings. Uh, when he writes Luke and Acts, he's bringing up historical moments. He's bringing up landmarks. He's being very, very detailed, which 
can be kind of a scary thing if you don't want people to begin to unravel what you are saying to be true. In fact, some of you guys may remember a few weeks ago, if you remember this, it's impressive because I, I couldn't remember all the details. Uh, I mentioned to you too, uh, about a guy named Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey was a biblical skeptic, but also an archaeologist. And his design and desire was to discredit scripture, specifically the book of Luke and Acts, because as he read these two books, he was like, it's too detailed, it's too specific, this is where I'm going to be able to debunk the validity and the authority of scripture. So he began to go and take some archaeology trips to follow some of the writings of Luke, and over time, he became a follower of Christ, because he could not dispute what he found to be accurate and true from the writings of Luke and Acts. In fact, it, Luke goes on to say in that passage of Luke 1 through 4, he says, I'm investigating, I'm writing it in consecutive order, which is great for us as Westerners. Our Western mindset is we want things to go in order, which I guess for you guys it would be this way. We want things to go in consecutive order for the very purpose of knowing the exact truth. I want you to know what the truth is. I'm not trying to, to, to deceive you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm trying to reveal to you through careful examination and investigation, this is the reality. This is the truth. And we are in a day and time where we want to have moral relativism. There is no absolute truth. And then here is Luke saying, no, no, no. If you'll take the time to investigate it as I have, you will see that this is the exact truth. And if you will come under its authority, it will set you free. It'll be a truth that will begin to, to open up your eyes and your heart to the reality of the person of Jesus, of what he came to accomplish here upon this earth. And if you take the, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, Luke is a very lengthy writer. If you, if you begin reading one of his books. It just kind of continues on because he's so detailed. And um, more or less, if you add them up, there's about 20,000 words in the gospel of Luke and about 20,000 words in the book of Acts, about 40,000 words. And you say, oh, that's interesting information, I suppose. Luke took the time to investigate and write down 40,000 words so that one person would know the truth, so that one person could hear of the birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What, what would our community look like if we had the kind of tenacity to say, I would give 40,000 words so that one person in my sphere could know the truth? how differently it would look. How differently just for yourself personally, but for our community around us to go, this is that crucial and important that I would expend this kind of energy that you might know the truth of Jesus, that you might come to saving faith in him. And so that's why I encourage you, like, like I've mentioned before, as opposed to going to either extreme of this idea of go out and you be the only ones that are sharing your faith, do that but also to invite them in so that they can hear the gospel from within this place through song or through prayer or, or through the preaching of his word. But we want to we wanna utilize both of those things, both going out and inviting people in because we want to uh, exert ourselves so that they would hear the truth of the gospel. Now, that's just a little bit of, of, of intro of what's going on, but now let's take a look at the meat. It says in Acts chapter 1, it says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. There's a couple of things that I want you to note, that as, as we go into this, if you're taking notes, that I want us to, to, to have within, within our life and things that are principles that we can take. And the first is this, is that we would have a, a proper theology. That's number one, that we would have a proper theology. If we're going to go forward as a church, if we're going to be reset and just be reminded of what that mission is, it's good for us to have a proper theology of, of what the truth is. Luke already talked about that in his gospel in verse uh, three and four, but he's also talking about here of, in verse one of, of Acts, he says, Theophilus, I've written to you all that Jesus began to do and teach. 
He's, he's saying that the, the story's not over. That was just the beginning of what Jesus was doing and teaching. The, the book of Acts, some of you may even have kind of as a subheading within the book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Apostles. And, and there's truth within that. But really, this is the continued story of what Jesus is accomplishing through the person of the Holy Spirit and through the people of God, his church, to accomplish the the plans of the Father. And I didn't make that up. I got that from a guy who was much smarter than me. His name's Alan Thompson. And he said, a very long-winded way to maybe have like a subheading of the book of Acts is he said, it would be the acts of the risen Lord Jesus through his people by the power of the Holy Spirit and for the accomplishments of the Father's purpose. I don't have that on the screen, but I really like it. So if you want it afterwards, I'll give it to you. But he he says, the book of Acts is the acts of the risen Lord through his people by the power of the Holy Spirit for the accomplishment of the Father's purpose. That's what the book of Acts is revealing to us. It's, It's the acts of the risen Lord. And so it's not just that we want to have this idea that Jesus began and was doing things in the Gospels. It's that he's continuing to to do things and to teach things even throughout throughout the book of Acts. His his life and his ministry, though he is resurrected and ascended, it, it, it didn't stop. The impact has not stopped of what Jesus accomplished and is continuing to accomplish. Four specifically, look at verse three at the very end. It says that Jesus was appearing to them and uh, by many convincing proofs that he's alive over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. So for 40 days, I'm not saying 24-7, for 40 days, Jesus is basically saying, here here are the priorities. One, I want you to know that I'm alive because that's a big priority, that I am the risen Lord. But two, he's teaching them. He's spending time with them. He's speaking to them so that they can know what the truth is, what the mission is, what it is that needs to be accomplished. Could you imagine that kind of, uh, that kind of lesson, that teaching time of what they were just soaking in? It reminds me of stories of, of, uh, of individuals, of, of church leaders overseas who will huddle up into a room with maybe just one light bulb in order just to hear somebody teach the truth of the scripture so that they can then take it back to their village so that they can teach the truth of the scripture. And they'll be huddled around that one little light for hours upon hours because they want to know what the truth is and how to share that truth. We're very privileged as individuals that we have copies of the scripture, that we have just years, hundreds of years within our country to be able to freely come together and to to read the word so that we could gain a proper theology for the purpose of sharing what that proper theology is. And at the heart of this, at the heart of the mission of what God is wanting to accomplish, he says here at the very end of verse three, he's speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. I I, want to show you at the end of the book of Acts. Do we have those? Acts chapter 28. I'd never noticed this before until I I heard a man preach on on the book of Acts, and he said this really bookend. In, In Acts 1, he speaks of the kingdom, and then at the very end, this is the last chapter of the book of Acts, the Luke is writing, he says that when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them solemnly, testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. Go to the next one. And then Acts 28, 31, Paul is preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. At the heart of what Jesus is wanting to explain to the apostles here in Acts 1, and at the heart that what Paul continues to carry out throughout the book of Acts, even to the end, is, yeah, we want you to know about the Lord Jesus Christ because this is going to be helping to advance the kingdom of God. Because, again, we are a people of the entire Scripture, New Testament and Old. In the Old Testament, again, it's about advancing the kingdom of God. God calls out the nation of Israel to be his chosen people, not just so that they're the only ones that get to know about God. He wants them to be a light to the Gentiles and a light to the nations. That same heartbeat of God continues on as, and even goes a little bit, seems like a little bit more of accelerated whenever Jesus comes and the Holy Spirit comes, that his heart's desire is that his kingdom be advanced. That's why a few weeks ago when we shared with you our vision and our mission and our values Specifically, the wording of our mission is that we would advance the kingdom of God by making disciples of Jesus, who in turn make disciples of Jesus, because we want it to be the the focus of it is Christ 
and Jesus and his name being lifted high and people calling upon his name to be saved for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom. So that, that, that his name and his glory will get out. Because that continues his agenda from Old Testament to New Testament to today and on forever. It's his glory, it's his kingdom that we're wanting to get out and made known. We want to be his foot, sh- foot sh- soldiers to make that a reality. And so for 40 days, there's this crash course of theology. At the end of, of Luke chapter 24, the gospel of Luke, Jesus is speaking with his followers. He's just risen from the dead. And it says he opened their minds to the scriptures. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Going on here, it's not that we just want to have a proper theology, but we also want to have a a proper confidence. In verse 3, Jesus is presenting himself alive. Don't skip over that, underline that. That is at the heart of our faith. He's presenting himself himself to his apostles as alive. He's not... Casper the friendly ghost, he, he's, he, he, he is alive, he's risen. That, that is what separates us. There are other faiths that talk about how their God came to earth. There are other faiths that talk about how their God was even killed or sacrificed himself. But, but the faith of Christianity that so sets it apart is the fact that we would say that our God came down, he lived a life, he sacrificed himself, he died, but he's alive. He is alive, and he's alive forevermore. And if we lose sight of that, then we lose sight of what would be our confidence. It's the fact that the apostles are sitting and talking with the risen Lord that they went from scared, locked in the upper room, to being just confident to go forward with, this is the truth, and I'll die for it. I'll lay down my life for it, because this is true. I watched that man die, and he's alive. When we lose sight of that, and we only, and if we only focus on that at Easter, then we miss sight of what will remind us and instill within us a confidence to go forward and share this truth. So, if at any time you're wondering, should I share about Jesus with my friend? Are they going to get uncomfortable? Is it going to be offensive to them? Probably, Jesus is offensive. But you have the confidence to say you need to know him because he's alive. The fact that he's alive proves that all this stuff that I've been studying, all this theology is true. Some of what we struggle with is confidence as a church and as individuals of can I share this? What if they question this? But you have a confidence because he is risen and he is alive. He also says here that he is alive, but he's also speaking the things concerning the kingdom. Can I remind you that as he spoke to the apostles, he speaks to you today as well? He does. And sometimes people will go, well, I I think he may speak to you because you're going to preach his word. But one of the most harmful things that any one of you, if you're watching online, if you're sitting here, that you can do is if, if your Christian life is, I'm going to go to church on Sunday or whenever it is that you gather to worship with a church family, and I'm going to get filled up with the truth of his word, and then next Sunday I'll get filled up again, you're running on E like the rest of the week. You need to get filled up with the word of God and the presence of God and the person of God every day because he speaks to you. He speaks to you as a son or a daughter that he wants you to know who he is. And so some of you might go, well, I I don't don't know what he's saying. Get into the word. This is his written revelation of himself so that you can know who he is, what his truth is, how to live your life, how to be transformed, how to be saved, how to be able to escape the penalty of sin and death and have life eternal, and then how to live this life abundant and free upon this earth. Get into his word. Know what he has to say. Don't don't wait or reserve it for a Bible study or for a sermon on Sunday. Get into his word day in, day out. You desperately, desperately need it. The other thing he says here in verse 4, it says he was gathering them together. Uh, One translation, uh, if you kind of go into the nitty-gritty of it, is, is, is that he's eating with them. Again, another evidence of he's not a ghost, <laughs> that he is alive. And, and I think that's just good theology. Eating together is a good thing for us to do, of, of, of taking that time of sharing a meal, gathering around the table. It's inviting people into fellowship. 
if I can just give you a practical thing that you can do in your life, is we're wanting to advance the kingdom. We're wanting to proclaim Jesus. And sometimes we make it more complicated than it needs to be of, well, I'm going to get the four spiritual laws, or I'm going to go through the ABCs of Christianity, and I'm going to sit them down, and we're going to discuss this. I'm going to have like a PowerPoint presentation. And I think what you need to do is just come along and live life with them, and everybody eats. Meet someone for coffee, meet someone for a meal, and discuss with them what, what it is that Jesus is doing within your life. I, I just had a meal this week uh, with, with a guy that I've been spending some time with, and, and I was just asking him, I haven't visited with him probably in a, a little over a month, and I was just asking him, I said, last time I talked to you, you were reading through the book of Proverbs, how's that going? And he said, I've actually, I, I, I'm now going through it my third time. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, impressive. He's like, I'm just craving knowing the wisdom of God. And, and all it was was a simple question of just, what are you reading right now? And we got to talking about the reality of, of a, a confession in my life that I think is a confession for a lot of us sitting here is an area that I want to improve in is sharing my faith more. I think we could all raise our hand and go, there's enough scripture of that we're to make disciples, that we're to be witnesses of Jesus, that we're to proclaim his name so that people can call upon his name to be saved. I think we would all say, yeah, that's our mission. That's our responsibility. But how often are we making that reality? And as he and I were talking, I said, one of the things that, that I found that I think can be helpful is if you will just utter the name Jesus out of your mouth more regularly he might become more regular in your conversation in everyday life. And what I mean by that is this. Sometimes pastors and preachers will get up here and just hammer on you of, you're not sharing your faith, share your faith. Well, do that. <laughs> but maybe with a brother or sister in Christ, someone within like a Bible study or an accountability group, just a good friend, are you talking to them on a regular basis? about their relationship with the Lord? Are, are you spending that time with them in order for them to, to know uh, that you know Jesus? That it just becomes a natural kind of rhythm of your life just to share with them who Jesus is and what he's doing in your life? Because if we're uncomfortable talking about with a friend or a loved one about who Jesus is in your life, how, how are we gonna go forward otherwise? How are we going to continue to do that with, with those who are outside of the faith? Make that a regular rhythm of your life. And so we need that proper theology, I think, to go forward to advance the kingdom. We need a proper con or a, a, a confidence. But those two things in and of themselves are not near enough for us to accomplish the mission that God has for us. We have to have this promised power. Look, look at verse, uh, verse 4. It says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. And if you'll just make a note, he quarantined them. <laughs> <laughs> he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. If, if you see that on the screen where it says to wait for what the Father has promised, I don't know why New American Standard has this, but what is literally, um, but to wait for the promise the Father had promised. To wait for the, for the promise the Father had promised, which he had said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The promise is the Holy Spirit. The gift is the Holy Spirit. You could have all of the Bible knowledge in the world, a proper theology. You could have all of the most profound confidence in the world. Good for you but we will not accomplish anything without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and within our church. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It's just not possible. Uh, at the end of Luke 24, 49, I think we have that one. I love the way that Luke phrases this. He says, behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, which is the Holy Spirit, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. I love this, this imagery. He uses the imagery of you're clothed in Acts. He talks about how we're going to be baptized or immersed. It's just that the Holy Spirit is going to be all over you. And, and we, we don't have the time to get into it. We may a little bit next week. But when you place your faith in Christ, you've repented of your sin, you've professed Jesus, confessed Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit in that moment comes to take up residence within you, and he is transforming you. One of the questions that I 
visit with people a lot of times is, how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I have salvation? And, and I, I've kind of come to a point of, there might be a date that you look at, which is great, that's fine. Dates are fun, but dates don't save you. Jesus does. But my question is, is there a moment where you can look back and go, I, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I repented of my sin to believe in him. And he changed me. Is there transformation in your life? And some of you might say like me, well, I was young when I confessed Jesus as Lord. I was six years old. And so I didn't go from drug dealer to follower of Christ. I went from pretty good kid to follower of Jesus as a six-year-old. But what I can see is the transforming work of the Holy Spirit within my life since that time. And that he's still working in and within me because I am transformed because he has changed me because hopefully I don't look like the world around me that I am going to go in and be a part of it to infiltrate it, to liberate what's going on, but, but I'm different from it. And if you look at yourself and compare yourself to, to the world, to your closest friends, is there a difference? Is there a transformation within your life because of what God has done in and through you and through the person of the Holy Spirit? You have this power. It's, it, I love the fact when he says in verse six, he says, so when they had come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And before we beat down on them and go, man, these guys are missing it. They'd read enough Old Testament scripture to know that there was going to be a restoration. It's just good idea, right theology, just wrong time. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That's not for you to be concerned about. It's not for you to know the times or the epochs, which the father has fixed by his own authority. But, but let's get back to what we're about right now. He says, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. When, when the events that occurred this week within our country happened, there were even moments where I was just like, what, what is going on? <laughs> And for some of you, regardless of how you wanted elections to go or, or anything, that, none of that is unimportant. But, and it's not, as, the, as preacher talk, to separate myself from that because we're to, to be a, a part of this world, engaged with this world. But I'm also recognizing that as a follower of Christ, I'm a part of a kingdom that's even bigger and eternal in the kingdom of God. And so I have a desire to say, this is not unimportant, and it is at times maybe fearful or anxiety that you're watching of events that are taking place, or there's concern about what laws may happen and what this will happen. And obviously there is an element of power within our political landscape. There is. But even when we read in Colossians this morning that that all rulers and authorities are under the jurisdiction of Christ. <laughs> that that we, we don't need to be unconcerned or disengaged from what's going on within our world. We should be engaged within it. But we also, as followers of Christ, recognize that that's an element or a, a, a kind of power. But true power that is life-changing and culture-changing and transforming is the power of the gospel of Jesus being proclaimed by the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. And he dwells within you. And yet we cower at times. We become fearful at times because we don't know what the future is going to hold, and, and we don't. In fact, when, when Jesus is telling them in verse 8, he says, you're going to be my witnesses. That word witness literally is the word martes. <laughs> it's where we get martyr. Now, for them back in that day and time, it just meant witness. That's all that it meant. But because so many witnesses of Jesus went to their death because they would not deny him, that that became synonymous with what we think of as the word martyr that there was this, this passion and this desire to want to go forward with what we knew to be true, so much so that he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is pretty, okay, this is home. I, I, I like the fact that you're not making me leave, Jesus. I can be comfortable here, but he doesn't stop. He says, then you're going to go out to Judea. Well, that's a little bit more uncomfortable, but, but I still kind of know the political landscape, so I can go out there. And then he says, but then you're going to go to Samaria. I didn't know if I would go here or not, but 
When he says go to Samaria, that has everything to do with ethnicity and race. And, and I'll, I'll put this out there, and we're not going to get into it, because to me it's not a political thing, it's a theological thing. If there is something within us that we look upon someone with, that is another ethnicity and we think somehow, some way, I'm greater than, that is not just wrong, it's heretical. We are created in the image of God, every one of us. And for any of us to look upon someone that has a different skin color and go, I kind of find myself a little bit above you for whatever different reasons it may be, it's heretical. Every single person on this earth, even ones we disagree with, are created in the imago Deo, the image of God. And he desires that every tribe, every tongue, every nation would gather around the throne and praise his name. That's what the kingdom looks like. That is why we are willing to say, yeah, at Mission Point, our mission is to reach our community and also beyond, that we would go beyond our our borders and go beyond our comfort zone, even to the remotest part of the earth, because that's what you've called us to, because God, you love them all. You want them all to have an opportunity to hear the name of the Lord, to call upon the name of the Lord, and you've decided to use us to make that happen through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And so what we have to do is put aside those things. And if we're struggling with a prejudice, we're taking that to the Lord, not ignoring it and saying, God, help me, help me to have a heart to recognize that these are men and women, boys and girls created in your image. And if they don't hear the name of Jesus, they will die and go to hell. My desire is that his desire is that all men would repent and come to faith in Christ, that all men would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And you say, well, that makes me uncomfortable to go beyond the, the borders. Uh, for some of you might say that the ethnicity thing, like I, I do, I, I, I want to love all people, but, but to, 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 to go and, and to knock on a door or to, to cross a border, to get on a plane, to go do something, so many different fears can come up. What, what about COVID? What, what, what are we going to do with that? And we have to recognize we want to be wise. We want to be smart about how we go forward, but it doesn't, a pandemic does not relinquish the responsibility of the mission that we would want to see people saved because if we believe the pandemic is as, is as bad as the most extreme person would say on the news, then we should say, well, that means they are dying. And if they don't know Jesus, they are going to hell. So we have to get up and we have to go. Remember, it was the church that whenever the black plague was going on, that is going out into the homes, wearing those really scary masks in order to minister to those who were hurting The church has always been at the forefront, willing to lay themselves down and be uncomfortable. And how can we do that? Because I love the fact that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, we also know him as the comforter. Why would we need comfort from the comforter if it's not expected that we're going to get uncomfortable? (laughs) We're supposed to be a bit uncomfortable. And that's why we need him. Others of us, we read this and we go, man, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Like this mission is just too big for one person. And God would say, yeah, it is. It's going to take all of you. And even in your own strength, it's going to take a supernatural effort through the person of the Holy Spirit. So we definitely need that power in our lives. Fourthly, we have to be purposeful. Look at verse 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. Angels. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand up looking into the sky? Isn't that a great word for us? (laughs) Why are you just staring off? You... He says, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now, I I am a fan of studying end times, eschatology, that's fun, but we can get so caught up in numbers and charts and graphs and yes, study Revelation. You're, You're encouraged and blessed if you do so. Bottom line, he's coming back. Are you on mission or are we staring 
To me, this, is, this could be such an indictment upon the church here today of we're coming together and we're looking up and we're, we're, we're in awe of, of Jesus, which is good. And we're worshiping Jesus, which is, which is great. We're having kind of that worship service. And if we're not careful, we could become a church at Mission Point of where we come together on Sunday at 10 o'clock and we are in awe of Jesus genuinely. And we're worshiping Jesus because he's amazing. But then we're, that's all that we're doing. We're only gathering. We're only kind of in our little huddle. And we're not recognizing that we need to break that huddle and we need to go forth together for the mission and for the glory of God. We have to be very, very purposeful about it. In fact, I shared with you a few weeks ago that the Greek word is ekklesia for the church. It means called out ones or sent out ones. We're to be on the go. We're to be, to be moving forward with the gospel of God. The idea of the church, that term came from, from, from German. And that specific word church in, in, in German means place or location. If there's anything that COVID has taught us is that if we get too tied down with the idea of church being a place or a location, we're going to be in big, big trouble. <laughs> we have to recognize that a place or a location is not a bad thing, but it's a tool used by the church, the people of God, in order to advance the kingdom of God. And so whatever that place or location looks like, it's a staging ground for us to come in together. And what I want us to be careful with is sometimes the church, the place has become a, 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 a fortress that we hold ourselves up in and, and we scurry out back to our home and then we scurry back in. But we recognize that this would be a place that would be really kind of more of a fort where we're gathering together as, as this group for the glory of God to put together our, our battle plans, if you will, to be able to go out and know how are we going to be strategic in reaching our community and going to the ends of the earth? How are we going to make that happen? How is that even going to be possible? Well, I think one of those is the last thing, persistent prayer. Look at verse 12. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together. And he said, we don't have time to go through the rest. You can read it on your own. <laughs> Some of you looked up in shock. <gasps> Stop mid-sentence. Oh, yes, I did. I want you to see verse 14. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. I I've, I've harped on that a lot lately. We had our first Sunday prayer last week. We've incorporated prayer in every service that we have for worship because it is essential. It's an essential element for us to have. And what I find that's interesting here is they're praying not just with the 11, but verse 14 says, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers are there. If you read in the gospel accounts, the brothers of Jesus didn't really believe Jesus. <laughs> and think about this. How many of you have siblings? Raise your hands. If your sibling was professing to be the Messiah, wouldn't that be a little bit woe? <laughs> if my brothers, Chris or Jeff, were like, no, I, I, I am the Messiah, I'd be like, okay. But if they died and came back to life, then I might be like, okay, maybe, maybe you are. And, 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 and so the, the reality is that the brothers of Jesus, even specifically James, who's going to become the leader of the church within Jerusalem and write the book of James, these guys will say, no, you're not. But they saw him alive, so it gave them a confidence. And they're about to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And they're going to continue to be a people of prayer. And based with the foundation of a proper theology and that profound confidence, they're going to go forward and change the world to where we're experiencing the effects of that change today. If it wasn't for their faithfulness, their obedience, their confidence, their theology, their prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, where would we be? It's because of that, in orders were reset of it got a little bit more specified of we want to advance the kingdom, but through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus, that he died and he rose again to save us from our sins. And so in the same way that for the apostles and the women and Mary and the brothers of Jesus, they have this essential calling upon them. It's the same calling that you have and that I have. There's a guy that uh, my, my, my parents pastor made this comment. He said, you have 
two callings in your life, a primary calling and a secondary calling. Both are important, vitally important. But your primary calling is that you are to make disciples of Jesus. Your secondary calling, you might think of as your, your vocation or your occupation. What is it that you do? But I like the terminology of primary and secondary because primary gives us this idea of priority or, or, or what's the most important. And sometimes what we do is we flip those. And, and even myself as a pastor, I could be like, well, I'm a pastor. That's my calling. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, my, that's my secondary calling. The occupation that I have as pastor is to be leveraged for the proclamation of Jesus. If, if you're a teacher, that's not your primary calling. It's your secondary calling. And you use that occupation, your secondary calling, in order to leverage that to be an example and salt and light for the person of Jesus. It, it, it doesn't matter what, what it is that that occupation or what it is that that responsibility that you have or what realm of influence, those things are all important. But God is saying those have been given to you, your abilities, your gifts, your talents, whatever it may be, to fulfill your primary calling. And far too often we've become distracted, I believe, by, by ourselves and by the enemy of saying, no, 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 make more of the focus of what it is that you that you do as a, as a vocation and forgetting that that's just, that's just to, to, to tee up those conversations so that I can talk to someone about my primary calling of, of Jesus. And so my desire is that this morning is that we would carry out this mission and, and we would do so with a boldness. And for that to happen, I believe it's, it's vitally important that we do that together. And so I do want to invite you this morning that if, if, if you're, if you're an individual, in fact, praise team, you guys can come on up. If you're an individual that you're saying, you know what? It's going to be with the power of the Holy Spirit, but God didn't call just one person. He called a group of people to be a part of this mission. Then what I want to urge you guys to do is, is if you do not have a church home and the Lord would lead you to be a part of the work here, then be a part of the work here. Join, be a member, be someone who says, I want to lock arms with you that we would go forward and that we would go forth because we're not designed to do this alone. For others of you, I just, I, just, I guess I just want to just ask and challenge you as I was challenged this week myself is, are you Bottom line, are you just living out that primary calling of proclaiming Jesus? And maybe to begin to kind of take a step toward that is maybe with someone that is closer to you, can you try to be intentional about bringing just Jesus up in a conversation within kind of that person that you know cares about you? Because if we're not just regularly talking about Jesus with those who are close to us, we're not going to be talking about him with our coworker that we know is lost. We need to get into that rhythm because especially as a guy, I've found at times it's like, do we want to share those things or would we rather talk about sports and the weather? It's much easier to talk about sports and the weather, but real relationship begins to happen when I'm like, yeah, I want to watch the Titans. I want to enjoy that. But I also want to live life with you and talk about what should be most essential in my life, which is Jesus. And maybe that for me is just something that kind of opened my eyes up over the last several weeks of what if I just get into the rhythm of just regularly just talking about him in order for me to become even more comfortable or confident to talk about him with anybody because he's just naturally coming out of my mouth. And so if you would, would you just bow your heads for just a moment? I'm gonna, I want to pray over you. And the praise team is going to sing a song and as, as, as we've done the last several weeks this is a time as, as they sing that you may want to join with them and, and sing along with them um, but it's also an opportunity for a, a, to you to respond that's what we call it, it's a, it's a response time and so for some of you it may be honestly maybe a little bit of conviction today and that's okay, I'm not anti that I, if you get a little uncomfortable that, that's between you and the Lord of I'm not, I'm not living out my primary calling. 
And if that's the case, I, I've had to repent of that just this week. It's so easy to get distracted with wanting comfort and security above being willing to be uncomfortable for his kingdom. So maybe this morning, during our response time, you, you, you just need to repent and say, God, forgive me. Help me to be obedient to what you've called me to do, who you've called me to be. And for others of you, it may be, you know what? I don't want to live this life alone. And I want to be a part of a church family. And, and I would encourage you that if, if this is a place and a people that you would want to be a part of, just know we don't want this to be a place where you come to uh, get served, but to, to serve. <laughs> because that's what Jesus did. That's what we want to try and do. But as they sing, you guys join with them. If, if you need to visit with myself, I'm just going to stand over here next to this table. You can visit with me if you have anything that you'd like to pray about. As we've done the last few weeks, if there in your seat, you would just say, I could just use a word of prayer. Um, our elder Tim is also available for you as well, just to come and, and pray with you and spend some time with you during this time. But um, as they sing, you guys respond as you need to. And what I want to invite you to do is, is if you would, would you stand? And um, it makes it a little bit easier if someone does need to get out and move or talk or come and pray uh, to get by you. But um, you guys join in song, you guys pray. But ultimately, this is your time to respond to what you heard from the Lord today. Grander earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Stirred, I can't get my words out. Come and broken for my recovery.
Thank you guys so much. Uh, you can have a seat for just a moment before we're dismissed with a word of prayer. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention to you is, um, uh, one, is that uh, some of you guys have, have known Miss Lauren. Uh, she, she's been here since uh, kind of Tiffany and I showed up, and uh, she's there in the back helping kind of run the sound. But uh, she and I had been visiting about uh, her joining the church, and she wanted to, to kind of begin that process and that discussion of wanting to join. And, and so uh, just visited with her for just a, just a little bit. And as you guys know, the, the, the whispered quiet conversation during like an invitation is always unique. And so uh, just even kind of going forward, like if you're someone who says, yeah, I would like to be a part of this church family and to join, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be sitting down and visiting and just making sure like here, here's some things that we believe theologically, here's some things that are here. Uh, and and even though I know a lot of that with her because I've lived life with her, it's also just kind of sharing with you if you're watching online just kind of what that process would kind of look like uh, because we we want to be good stewards as Mission Point of of you know what it means to be a member of the church and and that a member of the church doesn't mean salvation it means you're just joining with a group because you are saved with a group of saved people and so it's it's, it's that opportunity to have those discussions and that kind of thing but uh, I definitely if you are a member of Mission Point I would encourage you to uh, she, she'll love this to, to to say hey to her and and to, to love on her and that kind of thing uh, she she's been great to live life with over the last uh, almost year and so. Uh, but she uh, she does want to be a part of our church family and wanting to kind of go forward with that. And so we are very, yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, um, actually I won't, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but um, I, I would ask that we... I'm not going to go into specifics, but just pray for your church family. There, there was more than a handful that reached out to me this week of life happening. Um, and uh, not able to be here. And so just, just, just pray for your church family as they come to mind. And just, you can do that even in general. Uh, I would encourage you to do that as I know that you guys are, but just as a, just a reminder, friendly reminder to continue to pray for those who are not able to be with us for a variety of different reasons. And um, yeah, uh, it, it, 2021 will, will still be a unique time. And so we're going to go forward, uh, but we do need to be praying for one another for sure. I, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Is there anything that I'm forgetting? Go for it. Given the uh, political climate, there have been a lot of people that are dealing with fear and uncertainty. And I got a couple of scriptures for you, and I want you to meditate on those at any time that you are concerned. Romans 8 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Trust God. And number two, Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Trust God. It's all going to be okay. Amen. Amen and amen. <laughs> amen and amen. All right. Well, well church, uh, I hope to see you guys again here next week. If you're joining us online, we're always happy that you're joining us. If you're able to do so, we'll be in Acts 2 next week as we continue. I know for some of you, I saw your faces. I didn't get to finish Acts 1. Uh, go home and read that. You'll read about how they replaced Judas. And that in and of itself is its own sermon, which I'm not going to get fired up but on. But but it's just that reminder that they were down a man. And uh, sometimes the plan changes. Sometimes unexpected things things happen, the last thing you expected was the guy that you lived life with for the last three years was going to betray you. But the mission still went on. There was a, there was a curve ball. There, there was a, a, a stone thrown, but they, they continued on. And so uh, there's sermon two uh, in, in less than a minute. You're like, where was that earlier? All right. Uh, let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. And uh, yeah, great to see you guys. Father, thank you so much for, uh, for this church family. Thank you for uh, Mission Point and just the uh, the gathering that we have and, and the Father, the, uh, the calling that you have placed upon our life, Lord. And then, Father, I do pray that you would be with us as a people, that we would be reminded of, uh, of the passages that Kirk had mentioned from Romans and from Isaiah. And Father, as we read from Colossians, that, uh, that you, you are good and that you 
uh, are sovereign, that you are in control. And Father, help us to lean into you and onto you as we have moments, if we do struggle, if we do become anxious, if we do become fearful, not just with things going on within our land, but Father, in our lives internally or with our, within our sphere of influence, Lord, that when those things begin to creep up, that we would at that moment not struggle with wanting to pray, but that we would rush into your presence, uh, knowing that this is the, the, the very opportune time and very much needed that we need to come before you and to pray. Father, be with uh, those that are not able to be with us today. I pray that you watch over them. I pray for healing. Um, I pray for restoration. I pray for rest. Uh, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed.